The military has been hiding a plethora of secrets ever since its inception, whether it be classified technology, covert operations, or even unethical practices, there's simply no denying that the armed forces have a hidden side. But what if I told you there's a far darker, far more disturbing side to these secrets that soldiers have come forward and spoke about? And in today's episode, I'm going to share with you four bizarre and terrifying stories that deal with the military and the unexplained. You won't want to miss this one. In October of 1943, during the chaos of the German bombings of London in World War II, there existed a military group known as the ARP, or Air Raid Precautions, and they were searching through the rubble-strewn streets, and so one of these men, who was named Howard Leyland, would find something perhaps even more terrifying than the enemy in this war-torn wasteland. And then, the ground shook with the impact of a particularly close bomb strike, and so Leyland actually ducked into a quaking abandoned house to try and take shelter from all the dust and debris that was raining down on him. Now, at this point, it was night, so he had to use his flashlight to try and pierce through the murky darkness as particles of dust is kind of just dancing in front of his beam. Now, he's obviously scared because he might lose his life, and he's obviously in war, so he has no idea what can happen. And so he's trying to navigate his way inside this abandoned structure, and so he makes his way to the top of this darkened stairwell that would actually descend into this pitch black cellar. But despite the darkness, he decides to move forward and he kind of stumbles down to the bottom where he was just trying to crouch and outweigh the bombing and just praying that the building doesn't crumble on him. And so as he just sat there waiting in the darkness and it started to get really silent around him, Leyland started noticing the atmosphere around him change strangely. And he just got this, this really odd feeling that something wasn't right. And that would soon evolve into this unmistakable feeling of being watched, which would evolve into another unmistakable feeling of just this thick dread in the air. And so he's like, OK, maybe I'm not alone in here. Maybe I really am in danger. And so he's quickly shining his flashlight around. He doesn't see anything initially, but he shines it up to the top of the stairs. And what he sees is a horrifying sight because he sees what he described as this massive cat-like beast crouching at the topmost step, and it had these large glowing eyes and horns on its head. Now, Leyland would interestingly later describe how this entity seemed to exude an icy wave of an aura of evil, and then its eyes almost had this hypnotic quality to them that had held Leyland completely transfixed. But then as he sat there completely frozen in this thing, it would suddenly leap from the step, pouncing towards him as it howled this horrific scream in the air. But before it even hit the ground, it would just completely evaporate, completely just leaving him awestruck. Now, in that same moment, as soon as it vanished, he had heard human voices and footsteps. And he recognized that those are some of his fellow ARP members. And fortunately for him, they would emerge from the gloom to rescue him. And you could imagine that he was more than thrilled to be pulled out of there because he had no idea what had just happened. Was he hallucinating? Like, was this a real thing? Like, what, what even was this? And so his men pull them out. And so he's telling them what had happened and he's panicked and he's just completely overtaken by fear. But none of the other men had reported anything remotely like what he saw. Nobody heard the screech that this thing let out. Nothing. But to Leyland's surprise, some of the other men did claim that a very similar shadowy horned cat like beast with glowing eyes had been spotted by others in this same area. Now, clearly, Leyland was so disturbed by this encounter that he would later on go to visit a clairvoyant by the name of John Pendragon. This man was allegedly able to immediately divine the location of the house on a map of London. 
And so after doing some digging into the history of this house, the abandoned structure which Leyland found himself in in which he had the encounter of this being, well, it turns out that one of the previous owners years ago had been a very serious practicing occultist and who was routinely doing black magic rituals that involved the sacrifice of cats. Now, the individual had apparently gone mad and he hung himself at the top of those very stairs that would lead down into the basement after which the cat, I guess, monster had been spotted over the years. And so this led this clairvoyant Pendragon to conclude that the entity that Leyland saw was perhaps some sort of elemental spirit or a demon that had taken on a more feline form by absorbing the history of cat violence that had permeated the structure. And as bizarre and crazy as this account is, it was actually written in both Pendragon's autobiography in 1968, as well as Brad Steiger's 1993 book, Bizarre Cats. As far as the strange abandoned structure, the practicing occultist and the dark rituals, and the bizarre and horrific cat-like demon that Leyland saw, and is it Pendragon or Pendragon? Well, that all remains inconclusive. In 1985, Joseph was a new soldier in the army and stationed at a base in Arizona. And so one night he and his partner were on fence patrol duty and just kind of making their way around the perimeter of this base. Now, I want to point out here real quick that this was a very high security military installation. It had warning signs all over the place and a very strict shoot to kill policy for any unauthorized intruders. And so as Joseph and his partner were walking around, they suddenly heard this anomalous noise coming from behind them. And so in response, they would turn around and they would see something very odd. That wasn't a creature, it wasn't a UFO, it wasn't a light, it was benign. They saw this old man dressed in buckskin with long hair and braids and he looked kind of dirty and ruffled and he was standing probably no more than 30 feet away at most. And despite the man's seemingly harmless appearance, both soldiers had drew their weapons as he was clearly in a restricted area. And so Joseph and his partner began shouting to this old man, telling him he was in a restricted area and needed to put his hands in the air now. And so they're yelling at him and Joseph starts to figure that this guy must be some sort of vagabond. He must have Alzheimer's. Like he's clearly crazy and probably wandered into this base by mistake. And so Joseph tried to call for backup on his radio but it was just static, there was no response. And he thought this was weird, and so he actually called over to a friend for help, and they both turned to tinker with the walkie. But when they looked back, after maybe a second or two, the old man that was just there was completely gone. But in his place was this massive cottontail rabbit. And so the two startled men just looked around to see if the old man was still anywhere nearby because there had to be some sort of explanation, right? But he was nowhere to be seen. And then they heard the noise again, but this time from the opposite side of the perimeter fence. And when they looked, both him and his partner were shocked to see the same old man standing there on the other side of the fence, now staring at them. Now, this was very bizarre because the fence was very high. I mean, we're talking like 10 feet and decked out with razor wire. And so it should have been impossible for an old man like this to have so quickly gotten over it without any signs of detection or even injury. Now, clearly, Joseph and his partner were very frightened and disturbed by this very strange occurrence. And so they quickly got out of there and they never really spoke of it with their commanding officer. In fact, Joseph wondered what exactly he had witnessed that night. Now, as far as this mysterious old man who seemed to shape shift from a rabbit back to a human, and of course the massive cottontail rabbit that appeared in his place and then disappeared when he reappeared, and of course the impossible feat of the man reappearing on the other side of the fence, well, of course it all remains a mystery. But there is speculation that he could have been a skinwalker, which is most notably known as a shape-shifting entity from Native American lore, 
often reported in the Southwest. But of course, without any real way to verify this secondhand account, the true nature of what Joseph and his partner encountered that night will probably never be known. In March of 1989, two witnesses were participating in military exercises at Campamento Santiago in Salinas, Puerto Rico, along with members from the ORTC, from the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras, arts and mechanical college personnel from Mayaguez, and members of the U.S. Navy and Air Force. And so on this particular day, they were assigned to the range control office on the base. I want to make a note here that during one of their shifts, three officers arrived at the office, an intelligence major with a patch identifying him as a member of the intelligence center from Fort Huachuca in Arizona, a U.S. Navy officer in khaki uniform and a tall, dark skinned sergeant named Soto. And there was also a general from the Puerto Rican National Guard named Santoni present. And so one of the officers mentioned that there were problems as the barometric pressure up there was climbing and something could occur. And so, of course, the witnesses were confused trying to figure out what was going on. But then a thunderous explosion was then heard outside. And the officers immediately went on alert, frantically radioing personnel that whatever had crashed out there needed to be retrieved at all costs. And this was very dire. And so as it turns out, they had found a crashed craft of some sort, as well as its bizarre occupants. Now, despite the strangeness of it all, the officers actually told the witnesses about this, and not only that, but that the witnesses were about to have one of the strangest evenings of their lives. So later, the officers would inform these witnesses that they had located the occupants of whatever crashed in the wooded area. And so people of the Navy and Marines were sent to the location in the hills behind the base. This was an extreme emergency situation. And then one of the officers had commented that they were close, but that they got away and that the two witnesses were ordered to stay put in the range control office for hours. And then fast forward and nighttime comes and the major would enter accompanied by two very bizarre looking individuals that the witnesses said were not human and they never spoke. Now, these strangers were described as being over six foot nine inches tall with cream olive toned skin, bald heads and completely black eyes, and their heads were slightly larger than normal and flattened towards the back. They were very thin, wearing tight fitting uniforms in the same color as their skin. And the uniforms were open in a circle around the neck and covered them down to their wrists. Their torsos were also much shorter than a human's and their arms hung down to their knees and they had these long hands, but the witnesses couldn't really remember how many fingers. And their legs were also long and they wore high green boots that almost reached their knees. Now initially, these two strangers were just silent, but then they suddenly looked at the two witnesses who heard a question directed at the major in their minds. And the question was, who are these two? And the witnesses were speechless at this point. They couldn't believe what was happening. The major answered and spoke normally and informed them not to worry that these two unidentified people were soldiers of the U.S. government. But the witnesses could tell the strangers were actually very upset at their presence. And so the major would then look at the witnesses and would point to the taller being saying, this guy right here, he's the commander. And these guys are beings from another planet, from another galaxy that had apparently taken refuge in the United States. And that he informed these witnesses that they're here to help them because they were attacked apparently by another race. They fled, arrived on earth and specifically the United States. And now they are considered refugees within the territory of the US and apparently they have a treaty of cooperation with them. And they are apparently looking to reunite with their own people, which are dispersed throughout the universe. And as the major was telling the witnesses this, they're completely shocked by this because it's they feel like they're living in a science fiction novel. 
And so the major kept going and he added that the tallest entity of the two who what the witnesses could tell appeared older was of what they would describe as an advanced age and had apparently seen many historical events on Earth. The shorter one was younger, but only about 200 years old. And so the major kept telling the visitors that they came from a solar system in either the Orion or Sagittarius constellation, but they couldn't remember exactly which. Now, at that moment, as they're having conversation, the tallest and the older entity would actually penetrate the mind of one of the witnesses and seem to scan it. Now, this witness recalled having this horrific sensation of pain and appeared to complain. And when the being finished scanning his mind, the witness calmed down and the being then added mentally that he is the bad one. And to this day, even the other witness doesn't know why the entity said that. The being then scanned the other witness's mind, but apparently felt nothing, and that being said, this one is good. Now, to kind of back up here, everything had started right around 2 p.m., and it was already now 2 in the morning. And so the entire time, these two beings, during this interaction, this very bizarre interaction, seemed very upset, and that the officers would keep trying to calm them down. And according to the main witness, something had occurred that had really upset these two behind the scenes. And then at some point, black helicopters would descend upon the base, and this is where things would get even stranger. Now, apparently, these two large black cargo helicopters arrive, and the officers would tell the beings that the, these helicopters were there to pick them up. But the beings kept saying that they were upset, and they would only leave in their own ships with their own people. And so the tallest one kept repeating, I want to talk to your president. I want to talk to your president. I'm not leaving. And at the time, the president was Ronald Reagan. And so the major and general, of course, were getting very nervous at this. And they kept responding that there's there's no need to talk to the president, that the cop, that the copper, that the choppers were there to transport them. However, as these beings insisted on speaking with the president, the general presumably called somebody at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and then the officers insisted the beings board the chopper. They, of course, refused, and they escaped, running at high speeds around the base perimeter. Now, around four in the morning, this powerful thunderstorm would roll in and hit, and the entire base lost all electrical power. Then, a large bright white light appeared just outside the base and descended near the range control area for about 20 minutes and then suddenly vanished. The officers would then return and told them, okay, they're gone. And immediately after that, the power returned to the base. And as you can imagine from the witnesses' perspective, they were completely stunned. They had no idea what had just taken place. They had no idea even how to process what had just taken place. And so only minutes later, the officers that I told you about earlier, including the major, really, really broke it down to the witnesses that they needed to talk. And so they took these two witnesses, the two men, they separated them on different ends of the room. And the intelligence major spoke to the main witness, asking if he was OK or nervous and actually gave each of the men this little white tablet to help them relax. And so after taking it, the witness felt very uneasy about it, but you know, he took it anyway and was told as he was taking it to count from one to 100 and began to kind of feel out of it. And so they actually had a medical doctor arrive and took the blood pressure and pulses of both of the witnesses. And so at that point, the major just looked at them and explained, look at me, are you now relaxed? And he went on to tell them that you can never, ever speak about what happened here tonight. Do you understand me? And of course, as the major is just barking these orders at him, he's kind of like getting drowsy and the pill, whatever he took is just knocking him out. And so as he's barking these orders at him, he kind of just conks out and goes to sleep. And so after some time, he would wake up in the morning and the major was just sitting in front of him, staring at him. Now, the naval officer, General Santoni, and all the others had already departed the base. And so the major would then ask the witnesses if they were feeling okay. And when they said yes, he would tell them, or I should say he would inform them that they were allowed to leave. 
And so these men left the barracks, met up with the other ROTC recruits, and soon left altogether. Now, as bizarre as this story is, it is only one in a handful of strange stories that involve government cover-ups and strange government military operations in and around this area dealing with very similar crafts and humanoids. And unfortunately, during all of this, we never really learned the identity of the eyewitnesses either. Now, as far as the crashed craft, the bizarre occupants, the way the military frantically tried to retrieve them like they knew something, the mental communication and scanning abilities of these tall entities, their apparent treaty with the U.S. government as refugees, and of course, being told by the higher ups that they need to keep quiet about all of this, well, it just remains inconclusive. In 1992, an unnamed military personnel witness at Fort Chafee Army Base in Arkansas claimed that alien entities had taken part in a military exercise at the base. And so a report reads that airborne troops would conduct their exercise from April 15th to May 5th on 1992. And the event took place on the territory of the Fort Chaffee Army Base and the exercise was performed under the code name Operation Curtain. Special units of airborne troops from Venezuela, Ecuador, and the USA and Puerto Rico all took part in this particular exercise. The troops were sent to swamps in a very remote section of the base, and it was ordered not to allow the dummy bridge that was built for the exercise to explode, but Despite their best efforts, no unit managed to ever prevent the explosion of the bridge. Neither the Venezuelans, nor Americans, nor the soldiers from Ecuador managed to detect the enemy. Nobody can understand how the saboteur made its way without even bumping into any of the best units. Nevertheless, it happened. And according to one of the officers, commandos from Puerto Rico encircled the swamp and began waiting for the enemy at about 12.30 a.m. And a strange noise could be heard in the distance. And so at the time, all the soldiers thought that the enemy had landed on the other side of the swamp and everybody was ready to meet them. The only aspect that they did not know was the time it would take for the enemy to cross the swamp. Now, before the exercise began, the commandos were given an order not to use night vision devices at all. However, there was an American sergeant among the Puerto Ricans who had such a device, and so the soldiers soon heard these strange sounds coming from the other side of the swamp, and the sounds were getting more and more distinct. Everybody was staring in the direction of the sound, but no one saw anything at all. And suddenly, everyone smelled the strong odor of swamp. And so one of the Puerto Rican officers ran out of patience and began asking the American sergeant to give him the night vision device. And so the officer looked around the territory and then he saw something that would baffle him. There were three small, what he would describe as creatures, and they were clearly visible with the naked eye. And so the officer, shocked, gives the night vision device to another officer and so on, and everybody would see this weird enemy. And so the soldiers would eventually contact their command, and the command kept silence for a long while. And then it was ordered to carefully watch the creatures without bringing harm to them. The creatures were, they were kind of like little people, about one meter high, and they looked absolutely white in the night vision devices. There was another such creature sitting on a stump as if watching the crawling ones. Now, at first, the witnesses thought that they were wearing some kind of helmet, but then they realized that they were not helmet, but long egg-shaped heads. And the officer could even see their big black eyes with no eyeballs. And it also seemed to him that they had two little holes instead of a nose. Now, he did not see a mouth, but that they had four digit hands and the officer would go on to say that a helicopter would soon arrive and take these little people away. And so at that point, the command strictly ordered everyone to maintain silence about the event and the American officer with what he saw was completely just awestruck by everything. He did not say anything about it for two years. 
Now, more recently still from the war-torn wastelands of Afghanistan is another exceptionally bizarre report from the country that allegedly occurred on January 25th, 2002. And it started when a group of US Marines were mapping caves near Tora Bora with their sonar equipment when they reportedly began having strange interference on their equipment from some unidentified signal that was coming from within. And so the soldiers just thought at first that it was some sort of jamming device of some sort that was screwing with their equipment, possibly used by the Taliban. And so these three men, Corporal Sawyer, Wade, and Sergeant Carlos Ramos, allegedly ventured into the darkness to see what was going on because they had to get to the bottom of it. And as they kind of made their way down there and they would gear up and would actually search for the source of the signal that was jamming them, which appeared, by the way, to be embedded deep down in this cavern somewhere, they began to make their way down and they would kind of penetrate into the murk of the cave's bowels. Now, here's where it gets a little wild. Corporal Wade reportedly walked into an explosive device booby trap of some sort, which broke his back. And so after it explodes, he lands back and he starts screaming out in pain and the others arrived to his aid and they could see that not only was he hurt, but also terrified by something he had just seen. And so this soldier claimed that after he had been injured as he lie helpless on the cave floor, that something large had flown over him, which he said looked like a woman with wings. Now, the other Marines just thought that maybe the incapacitated Wade was just hallucinating from the severe pain. And so after making sure he was OK and radioing for a rescue team, they left him there to see if they could reach the signal source, which their equipment told them was not too far away at this point. And as the two remaining men closed in on the signal, it would suddenly vanish altogether, only to reappear again at approximately Wade's position. The two baffled Marines were trying to figure out what was going on when they heard sudden gunfire coming from Wade. And in addition to that, they would hear these screams that were also coming from Wade that sounded like pain and terror. And so they immediately rushed back to his position, going through the gloom to get to their fallen buddy. But when they finally reached him, they found that Wade had died and sustained injuries from what appeared to be some wild animal of some sort. And so at this point, they're just trying to collect themselves. They're trying to carry on. They're trying to still get a fix on the moving signal. And they then reportedly came across the creature themselves, which they would describe appeared to be a humanoid being with bat-like wings and feminine features. Now, even worse was that it was apparently soon joined by others that were just like them. Now, whatever these bizarre things were, they were apparently also extremely aggressive and they kind of just closed in on the two soldiers. And as they immediately attacked the two Marines who dropped their flashlights in shock and fired their weapons wildly into the darkness. And so when the rescue team that had originally been called to come retrieve Wade had arrived, they allegedly only found Ramos limping about, who was then brought in for medical attention and treated for a case of rabies before finally being discharged and sent home. And unfortunately, the bodies of Wade and Sawyer were supposedly never found. As far as these strange gray alien-like entities that were seen by military personnel at Fort Chafee and the bizarre winged humanoids or harpy-like beings reported by the Marines in Afghanistan, it all remains a mystery. Now, interestingly, in both cases, the military allegedly ordered these involved to maintain complete silence about the events that had transpired. And unfortunately, the fate of these soldiers, alive and dead, were never really found. Whatever these entities were and where they came from remains unclear. And so we have to ask ourselves, were these ghosts, goblins, ghouls, phantoms, interdimensional interlopers, or merely figments of the imagination conjured up by the fog of war? The answers we seek may lurk forever beyond our grasp. And unfortunately, we'll probably never have the answers. And because you guys have made it this far into the episode, I want you to all comment down below military secrets. So that way I know who made it to the end of the episode and well, who didn't. And if you guys enjoy this kind of content where we kind of deep dive into the cinematic style of storytelling of the strange, mysterious and supernatural, then what are you doing? Smack that like and subscribe button for more content on Earth because I mean, what are you waiting for, right? 
As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind, or at least try to, and I'll see you all in the very next episode.